So I found the new letter that Evan Rachel Wood submitted in her defence of the fake FBI letter, except I don't think it says what she thinks it says. It's basically an invitation to a Microsoft Teams meeting. It doesn't indicate that there is any open investigation. And even more tellingly, it is from the Crimes Against Children branch. And the only children that I know of that are involved in these particular allegations are allegedly a snuff film, which has already been debunked. There is an update on the court process, so we'll quickly skip through that next. As I've mentioned previously, Manson is asking for discovery and Evan has responded with, he's trying to silence me by making me talk. But we'll just have a look at what was submitted to the court. It seems like Gore and Wood have decided that they are going to try and keep their documents under wraps. But luckily we have a couple of lawyers working on the um, paperwork and they are able to give us some, some rundowns on what they think is going on from what they have read. So, this lawyer says, I suspect that the filings are somewhat similar as they both are motions to strike pursuant to California's anti-slap provisions. I wanted to link all of Gore's docs in this post, but cannot figure out a simple or easy way to post PDFs here and maintain anonymity. So, as an alternative, here is a rough outline of breakdown of Gore's filings. Buckle up, this is a long ride. So in her motion to strike, she asked the court to remove portions, more on this later, of Manson's complaint and any related remedies, money, damages, order preventing Gore from further or such conduct that would relate to those portions against Gore. The anti-slap basis for this is basi uh, basically asserts that Gore has a First Amend Amendment free speech protections that are related to matter of public interest. And Manson's allegations against her involving her participation in those protected activities, lobbying for domestic violence legislation, assisting law enforcement investigations, etc., should be removed from his complaint. Gore also states in a motion that she's seeking attorney's fees and costs. Overall, this is a pretty short motion, only a few pages in length, and gives bullet points referencing the portions of the complaint that Gore is asking to strike by paragraph and line of the document. You would have to cross-reference with the complaint to figure out what she wants removed from the court's consideration. I did this so you don't have to. See the last section of this post. Not much spice here, mostly boring legal stuff. Moving on. <laughs> Memorandum of points and authorities in support of motion. This is where we get some details. The supporting facts, background and legal arguments for the motion to strike are found here. Gore basically claims that the timing of Manson's defamation suit was a legal tactic to attack credibility, intimidate his accusers, and punish Gore and ERW for the Phoenix Rising documentary. It goes on to state that he cannot show that he would likely win in court on his claims, in part because he has publicly made similar statements about himself that would support the allegations made against him, specifically referencing statements he made in relation to Groupie as that particular video is part of his defamation claims. The next section of the document establishes the background of Gore's actions in relation to the allegations made against her in MM's complaint. It's lengthy, but I'll try to briefly summarise it with some interesting points to note. References to a Rolling Stone article about Manson's alleged history of abusing women and statements attributed to him bragging about it, and further reference to the abuse audio from the Smells Like Children album. These references are used to support Gore's assertion that she was assisting victims of abuse, including Manson's alleged victims. There is mention of how Gore and Wood 
organised meetings with accusers through the Phoenix Act organisation and in connection with the HBO documentary to share their stories despite the abuse having caused some of them to repress their memories for years. I found this part very interesting in light of Walter's suit with all the repressed memories recently being dismissed. Gore contends that the HBO documentary chronicles her efforts to provide evidence of MM's abuse on behalf of his victims to law enforcement and cites to a timestamp in the documentary that purportedly shows her delivering materials to the FBI. It also cites to an AP News article about the raid on Manson's home with a title that connects the raid to a SA investigation. There's also a quick note about five civil actions that were filed against MM for abuse. Either that snake is on the move or Mocky is just barking at anything. <laughs> Asserts that documentaries are matters of public interest and protected activities for the purposes of anti slap More discussion about Manson's statements related to Groupie, specifically citing to his Dinner for Five interview. Explanation about how Manson is a public figure which sets the bar higher for proving his defamation claims. Reiterates that Gore's statements are mostly echoes of statements Manson has previously made publicly argues that there is no defamation on that basis. Attorney declaration in support of motion. This filing includes all the exhibits that are referenced in the previous document. Note, the article titles in quotes are not the full titles. November 20, 2020. Oh, okay, this is all the other titles. We don't need to read that. So here are the exhibits from Manson's initial complaint. Um, their attachments A, B and C. Um, and this is obviously the fake FBI letter. Attachment B, which is the list, the checklist. As I said, it could possibly be um, used by both parties to support their cases. So, um, but it does seem like, you know, this is something that Ilma Gore was suggesting that they do allege against him. So it does, it does appear to be a little bit of organisation behind it, but it could be used for both parties. But this one here, this is probably, this one here is probably the most serious one. We connect, yeah, mm-hmm. So it does, I think that some of these things are quite literally damning for Gore and I can understand why she's trying to have them taken out. So that's attachments B, the alleged checklist, and C, the alleged script for various allegations. The big takeaway here is the burden-shifting element of her motion. When Manson filed the complaint as a plaintiff, he would have had the burden of proving his allegations against Gore and ERW, and ERW and Gore's motions to strike require them to show that Manson's claim against them arise from protected activity. If they can convince the court that it was, then Manson would have the burden to show evidence that he would likely win in court on the merits of his claims, which is, which at this stage, well, that's right, we're at this stage in the game. If he fails, his suit would be dismissed because I am limited to what is contained in Manson and Gore's filings and don't know exactly what evidence might be presented by either side. It would be tough right now to weigh in an opinion as to how this might all play out. Correct. Let's talk about Evan Rachel Wood's motion to strike. So after my last post on Gore's motion to strike, I did some more digging and finally found some fully imaged versions of ERW's filings. I now have her motion to strike, which includes a memorandum of points and authorities, all in one convenient filing instead of two like Gore's. I also have her declaration and attorney's declaration in support of the motion. Okay, so... and. It's, it is difficult to get your hands on these documents. So, you know, if lawyers are getting having difficulties getting them, they are definitely trying to suppress this from publicity. Yes, this is a considerably longer ride straight through hell. Enjoy. <laughs>
<coughs> motion to strike. Same deal as before. ERW is asking to remove things from Manson's complaint, citing to paragraph and line number. Again, I have cross-referenced the two documents and listed the specifics of what she is asking to strike in the last section of this post. She is also asked to remove any requests for relief, money, damages, order restricting similar future conduct. And MM is suing for related to the allegations she is seeking to strike. This motion to strike is pursuant to CA's anti-slap statute. So ERW is also asserting that MM's claims arise from her protected activity under the First Amendment. No surprises here. Nope, <laughs> there aren't. Uh, memorandum of Points and Authorities. This portion starts with a bold point blank statement about how MM did these things to ERW for years. Then in relation to Manson's intentional affliction of emotional distress claim IIED is suing for this in addition to defamation. The motion states that the court filings ERW made in her parentage case are protected activity. It further explains that ERW did not write the FBI letter and that there is a pending FBI investigation involving MM. Next two points in the memo are similar to Gore's. ERW's communications with other alleged victims were protected activity for the reasons of lobbying. The defamation claims about the groupie video are statements that are both protected and made by another defendant. So MM cannot show ERW made any false statements or acted, acted with malice. Attributing the statements to Gore here may seem like ERW is throwing her under a bus a little, but she is also asserting that Gore's statements are protected activity because they involve child abuse. The actress was underage when the sexual and violent film was made and is now dead. Well, we've proved those allegations to be false, haven't we? These points are explained in further detail in the memo, but echo Gore's motion for the most part, so I am going to skip over that. The next section of the memo provides a brief overview of MM and ERW's relationship, which is basically a hyper-condensed version of the narrative she gives about their relationship in the documentary. Then there is discussion about ERW's testimony before Congress, later publicly naming MM. Um, nothing particularly new or noteworthy here. The remainder of the section just outlines the allegations in MM's complaint. Yawn. <laughs> I agree. Thank you for saving us. Next, the memo discusses in detail the reasons why the RIED claim based on the FBI letter should be stricken from the complaint. Rehashes how court filings are protected, uh, then asserts and Manson's allegations that the letter was fabricated are false, but even if the letter was forged, it could not cause distress to someone who isn't aware of it. Well, you know, that's what we thought about... <laughs> Amber's claims about Johnny's text to his friends, she wasn't aware of them. They weren't to her, so. There is also an argument about MM's claims related to the FBI letter being barred by litigation privilege, which prevents communication used in judicial proceedings from being subject to tort liability. She could have a point there. It will depend on how the judge sees it. So the basic gist of this, ERW did not forge the letter, but even if she did, which is basically claiming she now knows that it's forged, Manson can't use it against her here. This isn't a quote admission of guilt on ERW's part, as there are multiple reassertions throughout this document that she did not forge the letter. The memo cites to several cases where this particular privilege applied even when the communications were found to be false. Finally, the memo states that even if the privilege didn't apply, MM can't meet the elements of the IED claim because he is not named. ERW's actions were not outrageous and she did not intend to inflict emotional distress. Also points to the lack of specificity in Manson's complaint as to what emotional distress he claims to have suffered. This part of the memo concludes with Manson's status as a public figure requiring the IIED statements at issue to be false 
but here he cannot make that claim because the statements in the FBI letter are true. ERW being key witnesses in the investigation and her, her family are the victim's safety is a matter of concern. Declaration of ERW in support of motion to strike. This one is written in the first person by ERW. It lays out slightly more detailed outline of Wood's path to stardom, how she came to meet Manson and their subsequent relationship, including a broad overview of her alleged allegations of abuse. Then she discusses her meeting with Gloria Allred and learning that the statute of limitations had expired on any criminal conduct she claims Manson committed against her. That leads into a summary of the Phoenix Act and HBO documentary meeting with other alleged victims, the other accusations and civil lawsuits against MM and her being aware of statements he made about Groupie on the Dinner for Five interview. She references Instagram posts she made about letters from Massachusetts and a Flo Florida representative questioning requesting an FBI investigation of MM. The declaration con continues by stating that to ERW provided evidence to the FBI and the LA Sheriff's Department and that to the best of her knowledge both investigations are ongoing. Here's where things get slightly interesting. ERW states that someone posted a recording of MM on social media around November 2020. She states that she recognised his voice on the recording and he said, I have effing, e effing geo maps of the people that have created all my problems. I know where they live, where their effing kids go to school, where they work, their parents. ERW claims that this is the reason that she began fearing for her safety because he was making threats against his accusers and she had been threatened by him previously during their relationship and later in 2014. So I'd note, this is the first I have seen of this particular recording being mentioned in relation to his suit. Not sure if it was mentioned in the HBO doc. I watched it when it was first released, and it seems vaguely familiar, but I can't be sure without going back and re-watching, which I am not particularly inclined to do. Has anyone heard this recording? Is there a social media link somewhere? ERW does not include this recording as an exhibit in any of her filings, so I would be curious to hear what is actually says and if there is some context being left out. So would I. Uh, I did go looking for it, incidentally, and there is no record of it anywhere, so just so you know. ERW also states that she only utilised the FBI letter in the custody proceedings with Bell, did not leak it to the media and did not fabricate or forge it. She asserts that she believed the letter was authentic when she provided it to the court in that case. She claims that her intention in submitting the letter was to explain to the court why she needed to relocate because she was fearful for her safety and not to inflict emotional distress on Manson as she had no reason to believe that MM would obtain her court filings in the custody matter. The exhibits ERW attached to her declaration are as follows, listed by number. Instagram posts where she names MM, letters from the two representatives in Florida, Massachusetts, posted on Instagram, printout of the Dinner for Five transcript. Oh, so they do have a transcript of it and a thumb drive containing the documentary. Attorney declaration in support of mo motion to strike. So they provide a bunch. I quickly skimmed over the exhibits, but I didn't see anything attached to any of the complaints that would be of particular interest. Well, we've got all of those anyway. This complaint seems to all contain allegations that anyone following this case would likely already be aware of. I may go back later and look some of them over a little closer, but I do have actual work that I am blissfully ignoring to put these summaries together, so I probably should get back to doing that first. <laughs> first, asked to strike the following portions from the introduction. They impersonated, it's the same ones that Gore is asking for, reached to strike this section in its entirety. Of course they do. <laughs> they have to gut his complaint so that they can win their slap motion. So, 
I have to say, after waiting all this time and putting in the effort to hunt these dogs down, I am rather disappointed. I was expecting to see some surprises, but there really aren't any. Yes, I agree. Manson's lawyers are taking the opportunity here to get in what hopefully will be the last word before the judge hears this and makes a decision. Manson's attorneys filed four documents yesterday uh, to rebut what the defendant said about the limited discovery request. We'll go over those quickly. There's a, another declaration by Howard King, his attorney. There's a reply to Wood's opposition uh, to the limited discovery. And then Manson also opposes Gore's request for judicial notice of the Gore versus Gore documents and also just so you understand what that is, the Gore versus Gore documents is Ilma Gore versus her sister, Brighton Gore, where Brighton applied for a temporary restraining order against Ilma, which we covered in a previous episode. Gore's objection to his evidence. Let's start with Howard King's declaration because it's an admirable one page. Okay, that's like a miracle for a lawyer to put what he wants to say on just one page, it's not even single spaced. It has two pieces of information in it that I think are interesting. And the first relates to Ashley Smith line. If you remember, or maybe you've seen on Twitter, I've showed part of a joint stipulation in the Bianco versus Manson case that the parties agreed that discovery was going along well, they needed a little bit more time, but that they both agreed that they were collaborating in good faith with each other and had noticed depositions of non-parties. And now we see at least who one of those depositions will be. And that's Ashley Smith line. King notices in his declaration here that in the Bianco case, she has been subpoenaed to testify for that case on August 17th. King's next piece of information relates back to the original hearing on setting this motion for limited discovery up uh, for an actual hearing rather than just dates. King expects that if the motion is granted, they're going to have to adjust out the dates of the anti-slap motions. In other words, even if he just gets this limited discovery or perhaps even slightly more limited discovery, Due to the timing of the parties and Ashley Smithline's deposition, which had to be noticed in conjunction with her counsel's schedule, those things will not allow for the hearings to be heard quite in time, just not enough time there. So expect uh, at this motion for limited discovery, if he is successful, he's obviously going to ask the hearings to be pushed out a little bit, which is perhaps reasonable. Let's take a look at uh, Manson's objection to Gore's request for judicial notice of the Gore versus Gore documents. And Manson's attorney cite cases that say, if you take judicial notice of other court papers, such as an affidavit, you cannot take judicial notice that the facts alleged therein are true. Well, that makes sense. Just because somebody provided an affidavit in another case doesn't mean those things were true. Now, that's different than taking a specific court order that has specific findings of fact in it and saying, well, I'm seeing these things as true. That's, that's different. Manson's attorney is here saying that the affidavits that were put forward in that case, you can know that they were put forward there. Those, that was sworn testimony but you can't say that those things are automatically true. And that I think is a solid argument. Now, he also makes the point that these affidavits to the degree that they go after uh, Brighton Gore's credibility are mere weighing functions. And that's not what you're supposed to do at the stage of the, of the case for the anti-slap motion. And, and I agree with that as well. It might matter later for Brighton Gore's personal credibility, depending on what she has to say in more detail later. It's not uh, determinative here because uh, the credibility of the witness is something that you would look at later. Manson only has to show his prima facie case. In Manson's opposition to Gore's objection to his evidence, he's basically making the case that if things are double hearsay, such as what a Agent Langer said, such as what um, Ashley Smithline said, those things would be cured in the limited discovery. That he's going to be taking the deposition of Ashley Smithline and he intends to subpoena this agent. So. He's not saying, let me get all the way to the motion and rely on double or triple hearsay. What I'm telling you is these things exist. And if you give me the discovery, I'm going to have that information directly for you to consider at the, that's a pretty good argument. He also argues that the other matters are completely relevant to the case, whether they're proven or not. And Manson makes the very good point. We're not saying these are, these are proven facts at this point. But we're saying they're in contention and the evidence is here. We're not here to weigh credibility or talk about this person might have a motive or this person didn't exactly say this was correct. We're here to show the prima facie case. And I think that's pretty persuasive for looking at most of these things. While some things could be excluded as double hearsay, if you get the discovery, you're either going to have to put up or shut up. And if you don't, then the judge, if he's not inclined to give uh, discovery anyway, 
is probably not going to look at double hearsay stuff and it becomes a tougher case for Manson because he does feel like he needs this discovery to get past the anti-slap motion, I think, or else he wouldn't be trying so hard to get it. So it's important that he gets this discovery to get past these motions. But in any respect, I think he has the better side of the situation right now that for purposes of what we're doing here, Judge, look at these affidavits. Manson's reply to Wood's response to Manson's request for limited discovery. And there are two themes in it. One, we're only asking for a narrow range of discovery and these people are gonna have to set for discovery later anyway, so there really can't be any prejudice in them having to do it now. And then the second theme is, wherever it is possible, dunk on the FBI letter. So on the first point, the limited range of discovery, Manson starts out citing some cases saying that the anti-slap motion is obviously there to prevent harassing lawsuits over protected speech activity. That's true. But there is a provision for limited discovery in certain circumstances and that the statute was not meant, the anti-slap statute, to get rid of meritorious cases. It's to get rid of harassing cases. So he makes the point that his discovery request in this motion is very limited and I'd wondered what he would say about this because while he did kind of lay out the facts that he expected from each witness etc um, what would be the terms of a proposed order and here he essentially concedes it and says we are these are not unbounded depositions as Wood states we are willing to have a bounded range of topics and that I think makes his case for limited discovery stronger because in theory this would not be a fishing expedition this would be an order at this stage of the case for to set for a deposition on topics that are just referenced in whatever order is to come. You can ask about this letter. You can ask about this meeting. You can ask about the communication with these people within this time frame kind of thing. You can't ask about uh, what she's doing right now or uh, just the general things that you could in a deposition, which typically are essentially unbounded. Manson's attorney is saying that this would be bounded, narrow, narrowly tailored uh, depositions for the things that are at issue in this motion. And he makes a good case that they're gonna to have to set for discovery later. And in this, he uh, counters an argument that I think people have seen coming and I've seen coming and probably is gonna come, which is that if this case were to get narrowed down by the anti-slap, Wood is basically saying, I didn't do this stuff, okay? I didn't make the defamatory statement about the groupie video. You got Gore allegedly saying that. I didn't hack into the computers. According to your own complaint, she did it. All you're basically doing is trying to tag me in this lawsuit saying, well, I wanted to go along with it. And so let me out of this because there's, especially if the anti-slap is successful on the, con the conspiracy for intentional infliction of emotional distress, it doesn't really matter if there was a conspiracy on these other things, which are very defined acts. And Manson's attorneys addressed that saying that, no, we've alleged enough here that you were involved in a conspiracy with Gore. And that makes you vicariously liable for her actions and vice versa, depending on the circumstances. And that we've also alleged that she was your agent. And I guess this is why they try to make a big point of her being an employee of Phoenix Act and that sort of thing. Although from the finances we've seen on Phoenix Act, how could anybody have been employed by it? But that's not proven at this point. All we have are the allegations that she was. Uh, so Manson is saying it inside the complaint, we're showing that you were principal agent and also co-conspirators for all the things that we're talking about. So he's already moving to make sure that everybody knows where he's going to stand on that argument. But some of the specific things in a reply that stand out, are, and it's not that lengthy, are these. On the FBI letter, Manson's attorneys try to rebut the idea that Wood's attorneys have that this, is, this letter was subject to judicial privilege, even if it is false, because it was only filed in a court proceeding. And so true or false, it can't be a subject of this separate lawsuit, that that's a litigation privilege. And there's, you know, they have a good legal argument for that. But what Manson's attorneys come back and say is, no, we alleged in the complaint that this letter was produced outside of the litigation context and would be used outside the litigation context. It was found by Brighton Gore at a later time on Ilma Gore's um, iPad and there was testimony that they were sending it back and forth. And Manson notes in his own complaint that he's alleged that this letter was going to be part of this conspiracy. Is there really a fact coming in the near future that says this letter was shown by one of the defendants or their agent to this person? And here's the evidence of that. Not an interview somebody did on, on YouTube or something somebody posted on Instagram, which could be true. 
but has to get into evidence, right? So if you want to link this document to this conspiracy, at some point you can't talk about, well, I think it would be used for that. You're going to have to show that it was. So again, that could still come. I'm not saying that it isn't going to come. Moving beyond that little bit of um, loose language, they come back to the dunking function and talk about Wood's declaration about how, uh, hey, when I filed this letter with the court, you know, I didn't knowingly make a misstatement. I believed it to be true. And they say, whatever that actually means, uh, this letter was a fraud. It was a forgery. And, and they did know it. And there's no excuse for it. And they don't even dispute it. So they're just, just a series of massive dunks, just complete dunks on the phrasing of her declaration and what that means in terms of the fraudulent use and creation of this letter. And they make the point repeatedly that neither Wood nor Gore address where this letter came from, who wrote it, uh, what the intent was behind it, or do anything to dispel the notion that this was part of this chain of acts to make Manson look like a serial abuser who was super dangerous. Again, maybe he is a serial abuser, super dangerous. That's kind of beside the point for this stage of the case, which is he's saying this letter was part of that. And for sure, their only uh, winning argument here potentially is, Judge, even if all that's true, don't look at it because it was filed in this child custody case and there's no evidence of it showing up anywhere else relevant to this case, which I think is a powerful argument. But it leaves out there Manson's core contention is, Judge, these people have massively lied to the court about things that pertain to this case, about a child custody case, and they want you to ignore it because of litigation privilege, even though we're in a different case talking about it differently here. They, they need a technicality to try to avoid forgery, fraud, and impersonating a federal officer. That's also a powerful argument. Even if it doesn't all turn out to be true at this stage, it's a powerful argument. I would rather be in Manson's shoes on this argument than the defendant's shoes because they're trying to keep this thing completely excluded. It definitely looks bad, and they do not... And that's perhaps because they cannot address the source of this letter. And by cannot, I mean, obviously they could not know, but it also can be they cannot do it because it would just confirm what Manson is saying, how it was created and what its purpose was. This one's very messy for the defendants and it's no surprise that the attorneys for Manson would just dunk every opportunity they get on it. And the final theme that runs through this is Manson's attorney saying, well, what's Wood's problem if we have, if we ask Gore about this letter then? Why would she be caring about having it struck out here? And kind of using this division in the defenses to say, well, why would this person care what we do with this person and this person care what we do with this person? Hey, Gore hasn't even filed a declaration in this case. She's not disputing anything. Uh, Wood's the only one talking on this thing. And that, and that has also created online, I think, a, a, a view in some people that maybe these defendants are not completely aligned on this case. And I wonder that too, although I, I can also see a strategy where they are aligned and you just let Wood do the talking for now. There are a couple of reasons why that could also be true. But that's still right now, I think, a net benefit for, for Manson. It lets the defendants be a little more technical in the arguments on trying to get things excluded or dismissing these causes of action. But then it surrenders the narrative to Manson because now he gets to say whatever he wants to say, bring up whatever evidence he wants to bring up. And he pounds, you know, throughout these documents earlier in here that, the, that we're alleging these people were co-conspirators. They are liable for each other's actions because they were in a concerted course of conduct to damage Manson. So if Gore made a libelous statement, a slanderous statement, that's also going to be imputed over to Wood because it was in furtherance of their common scheme and vice versa. So he's, he's setting up these arguments that you can't just pretend like, hey, I didn't know anything about this because the allegations of the complaint completely tie you into it. So there's nothing radically changed in these documents that are filed. Everybody wants to have the last word. The one real piece of information in it I thought was new was that they have noticed the deposition of Ashley Smith line. So the real showdown is coming and we'll know very soon uh, who gets the better side of this. Both sides have put forth some really good arguments, I think, and therefore it kind of comes down to how the judge feels about this case. And that's something I don't know, but we will all know it soon. Thanks. Bye. So that's just a quick update on the current court proceedings. I believe there's going to be more in the Bianco case. Uh, she's deposed for three days time, so we expect to see something coming from that as well.